Hey, Haunted Tales fan. And this is your storyteller. Um, we're getting ready to go live in about five minutes for the broadcast. Uh, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes to discuss some things happening. Um, the YouTube channel, Haunted Tales from the Old Rocking Chair. Um, we're going to have to cut back on that for a little bit. Uh, my son, he's taking two college courses and two advanced placement courses this year. Plus, he's in band, so he's going to get pretty busy pretty quickly. So we're going to be probably doing, um, you're always going to get the podcast. I'm going to upload the podcast. And then we're going to try to do one or two videos during the week, um, probably a best of. Unless there's, like, one that's really, really, really good that stands alone independently, then we may do two. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that change. Um, tonight, we have a really good show for you planned. We've got um, stories from other dimensions, people from other dimensions. We have uh, Victorian house haunting. Um, we have some monsters at the bottom of the lake. Uh, and some creepy encounters type stuff, so it should be a really good, enjoying um, podcast this evening. Um, I'm really proud of it. I think it's the best one we've done yet. Um, it's got some great music. Uh, I think I really <laughs> slowed down a little bit on the narration. Um, it was pointed out to me that I do kind of talk kind of fast, so hopefully it's more enjoyable tonight, so I hope you enjoy it. I will be here the entire time during the podcast if you want to chat with me um, down below. Um, I'll be here the whole time. I won't be speaking a lot because I don't want to talk over my own voice because um, I want you to really hear the stories uh, during the podcast. So I don't want to talk over myself. But I will be here if you want to chit chat or, or visit with me. Um, always feel free to share uh, out to your friends. Uh, start your watch parties, and uh, let's check on the time right now. Give me one second. We got about three minutes until the, the uh, podcast officially starts. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions about the podcast or the Rift Radio Network. Um on how to maybe become a podcaster or like how I do my podcast or anything like that. Like I said, feel free to drop it um, in the conversation. Like I said, I'll be here the whole evening, so I'll be... I have no problem answering questions or chit-chatting. I'm also doing other things, so... <laughs> Multitasking here. But, um, yeah, so, enjoy the show. Um, like I said, I'll be here the whole time. Uh, feel free, we do have some great videos over on the YouTube channel. We're trying to grow that channel. Um, because we want to eventually, the goal is to get monetized. So we can get better equipment and make a better show for y'all. So, uh, that's my ultimate goal. Um, to try to get monetized either on Facebook. Make sure you go over to our fan page on Facebook. Um, that's when you'll find all the updates for uh, Haunted Tales from the Old Rocking Chair. And you will also, I, I pop in updates about the Rift Radio Network and some of the other podcasts available on there. Um, if you want to check out the network, you can always go to Blog Talk Radio. It's called The Rift. Uh, radio network um that's the production company i work through so check them out if you have any questions about the rift uh direct them over to howie odell he is the producer over there and co-founder so he's a fantastic guy he'll answer any questions you may have um i'm trying to think if i said everything that i needed to say does anyone have any questions right now before we get started Oh, 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 after the podcast, because I really don't have time now. If you guys are interested, uh, while I was recording the podcast uh, this time, I possibly maybe caught a EVP, and for people who don't know what an EVP is, and it's an electronic voice phenomenon, um, I was in a 
room by myself with the door shut um, about 2 o'clock in the morning, so there's no way it could have been anyone else. Or, And I had debunked, I moved in the bed because I was sitting in my bedroom. I moved around the bed, I moved my papers, I messed around with my microphone because I use a headset mic when I record. And there is a clear breath, an exhale that happens. And I chopped it out of the podcast and I have it on, saved over on a separate file. So if you guys are interested in that, I will certainly play it after the podcast if you want to hang tight after. Um, it was just a weird thing that happened that I thought, you know, I'd share because we're all a part of this paranormal community. So just let me know if you want to hear that. Um, I'll certainly do that after the show. Um, I'm trying to think. I think that's everything. So if everybody's set, I think it's about that time. So we'll get started. Huh? I just copied it over to a file. Yeah, it's still part of the podcast. It's just I clipped it. I'm trying to turn it up a little bit here. to welcome you to tonight's special broadcast. This work is protected by Creative Commons license. And now, a word from our sponsors. Beyond Earth Healing, your source for alternative and holistic full healing services by Reverend Kayla Ray. Beyond Earth Healing offers Sorry various about that. approaches to Somebody's energy healing to natural me and it healing causes the She is led by her guides, angels, and more to help you heal. Located out of Lockport, New York, you may contact her at 716-550-3881 or at www.beyondearthhealing.com. The Skeleton Key, this mystical shop found exclusively on Facebook, is stationed in Blossom, Texas. Purchase all of your very own unique religious, spiritual, and metaphysical items to include the beginner altar kits. Find them today on Facebook. Remember, you've always had the key. by the fireplace. Let me get settled into my old rocking chair and I'll tell you a couple stories. Haunting stories. Stories that are not for the heart. Some of these stories may not be about hauntings per se, but nonetheless will haunt you. Because after all, some of the most scary things in life are not ghosts and demons, but the people we cross on the street. If you're brave enough, keep listening. If not, get up and leave now because you'll never be the same. Don't say I didn't warn you. Welcome to the Haunting Stories from the Old Rocking Chair. Here's the story you've been looking forward to. I'm not from here. This has been a long time coming. Written by user I Miss Home. Let me start off by saying this will be a long read. 
I'm also going to tell you that what I'm about to type is something I've carried with me for the last 24 years. I haven't really spoken much about it since I was a child, and I've never spoken about it on any kind of public forum such as this. You're free to not believe me. In fact, I encourage you to doubt anything that you're told from anyone. I'm typing this message because I've gotten older and I've spent over two decades developing a life to the best of my ability. I've carried an immense weight on my shoulders that neither therapists nor psychiatrists treat as anything other than a method of repressing memories at best, and the delusions of a lunatic at worst. I do not blame you if you draw these same conclusions. I'm typing this in what I believe has become the most publicly traded speaking place on the internet for the sole purpose of attempting to drop the weight I've carried and move on with my life. This is more of a personal cleanse than an attempt at intrigue. And if no one reads this message and it becomes buried amongst the innumerable posts on Reddit, I will have at least gotten it off my chest. I'm not from here. And by here, I don't mean where I currently live. I mean where any of us live. Anyone reading this right now? It's now a few days before my 30th birthday, and this time of year always strikes me, because I started kindergarten on my birthday, when I turned five. I thought at the time everyone did that. You turn five, and when you turn five, you go to school. I didn't realize my birthday just happened to coincide with the first day of school. And a little over one year later, in about two weeks' time, it would have been 24 years to the day that my entire world vanished. I was born in San Diego and lived in a poorer suburb of San Diego as a child. I lived in an apartment complex called Lemon Vine Apartments. They were a bit slummier versions of the Lemon Vine Apartments found in Lemon Grove, a suburb of San Diego. My parents were divorced, but friendly. My mother was young when she had me, and she was beautiful. She was in her early 20s and was an inspiring model, and would regularly take trips to L.A. to do photo shoots. She did glamour modeling for magazines. She had a darker skin tone, being one quarter Indian, Indian, not native, and it gave her an exotic look. My favorite picture of her as a child was her modeling a luxurious wedding dress for a bridal company. I used to sleep with that picture when she would go to L.A. and I would stay with my dad, who worked for the city of San Diego. They shared custody pretty evenly and even did Christmas together as a family, even though they had lived when I was still a baby. My dad, his girlfriend, my mom, who was single, and me. Maybe things weren't as good between them as I remember, but I was six. So if there was drama behind the scenes, they did a good job of hiding it from me. On September 17th, 1990, Grandma had several pet ducks that would eat seeds from your hand, fly away, and returned every year like clockwork. My dad had to work at night for a week, and my mom was in L.A., so I stayed with my grandparents. Schools back then were pretty cool with that kind of thing, and I was sent home with all sorts of nonsense assignments you'd expect of a first grader who'd just gone back to school after summer break ended. The 17th was the third day I was staying with my grandparents, and my grandpa had told me to be careful outside because he'd seen a rattlesnake and wasn't sure where it had went. So since no one knew where the mystery snake had gotten off to, six-year-old me decided to go hunting for it. In hindsight, letting a six-year-old go looking around a farm for a rattlesnake was probably not in any Parenting 101 handbook, but it was the 90s, and I guess they didn't actually expect me to find it. There were woods on the property, but I wasn't allowed to go in there, so they probably figured that's where the snake had gotten off to. I spent all day outside playing jungle exploration on the farm, trying to track down this rattlesnake. And much to my excitement, when I decided to open the well house, which for those who don't have one looks kind of like one of those green electrical boxes on the side of the road, there it was, curled up, rattling away. I immediately slammed the door shut and ran to my grandparents' house to tell them I'd found it. Now, this might be my six-year-old memory exaggerating, but I'm pretty sure the snake was at least, like, 900 feet long, give or take. I found it, though, and I was excited to tell my grandpa I found the snake so he could do what he did and go out and shoot the thing. I ran to the back door of the house, which led you into the laundry room and through the kitchen. I paid no mind to anything until I turned left and entered the living room. 
expecting to see my grandparents, my uncle, and the neighbor couple all sitting in the living room where I'd left them, except they weren't there, and it wasn't the same living room anymore. The furniture was completely wrong. The hard and memorably uncomfortable hardwood furniture my grandpa loved so much was gone. The coffee table he made out of a tree stump was gone. Replaced by a fluffy grandma-looking furniture, a three-person sofa with a floral design on it, and the TV was in the wrong place. The newer than my grandpa's old sit-on-the-ground cabinet TV. The hardwood paneling on the walls were gone, or at least covered up by blue wallpaper. The hardwood floor was a shaggy, off-white carpet. The pictures of my dad, my uncle, me, and my grandparents were all gone from the walls. They were replaced by paintings and pictures of people I didn't know. As confused as I was by this, I was confused by everyone being missing. In my six-year-old brain, I accepted that they may have completely rearranged the house while I spent the day looking for a snake. But I didn't believe at all that they would just leave me alone. And I didn't see anyone leave. I didn't see the cars down the road, so I walked out the front door, which was attached to the living room, as they usually are and thought maybe they'd gone to the chickens or pigs. Both should have been visible from the front porch. But the chicken coop was gone. The pig bun had lost its fencing, and there were no pigs to be found. At this point, I was beyond confused, and I was getting very scared. I didn't want to be alone, and I didn't see anyone. Even though they lived on a small farm, the neighbors that had been visiting lived just across the dirt road. So I ran down our own dirt driveway and across the road to their house assuming that must have been where they went. I remember getting more and more scared as I ran to their house, and I remember starting to cry when their house was the wrong color. It wasn't the faded yellow house it used to be. It wasn't even the right house anymore. Nevertheless, I banged on the door. I remember at this point I was crying quite profusely because I didn't understand what was happening, and I kept wiping my face which covered it in dirt after having been digging around under stumps and logs for snakes all day. When the door opened and a woman in her late 40s to early 50s answered, and I'd never seen her before, I just started bawling uncontrollably. Everything after that point is largely a blur because nothing was right. I knew where I lived. I knew where I went to school. I knew where my grandparents lived. But I met people who lived where my and they were not my grandparents. I did not know them. I begged them to get my uncle to tell them who I was, but my uncle wasn't there. Through a series of various police and people in suits, I was brought back to the town I lived in after spending what seemed like 10 hours in the local police station trying to contact my parents. I had my home phone number memorized, but told them my dad would be asleep. But when they called that number, a person on the other end had no idea who I was or what they were talking about. I was asked to give the police officers my address, and I sat in the local police station while the police in my hometown went to my address. When they finally called the station back, they were informed that the name of the apartment building was incorrect. Lemon Vine Apartments did not exist, and the address I gave them was to an apartment complex called Merritt Manor and the apartment number I gave them was unoccupied. I believed at that point they were operating under the assumption that I had given them the wrong name of the apartments and the wrong apartment number, but I did in fact live there. When I was finally brought to my hometown, after changing hands a couple of times between police, I was asked to give the police officers my address again, and I was driven to where I lived. That was it. That was my apartment complex. But just like everything else, it looked wrong. It was painted a different color, and the sign that used to have the large image of a lemon reading Lemon Vine now read Merritt Manor. I took the police to exactly where I lived, and just as they said, no one lived there. From this point forward, the police attempted to contact neighbors, all of whom knew me, but none of them were who they were supposed to be. Every person that came out of the apartment buildings around me were the wrong people, and they didn't know me. From this point, they attempted to contact my father, which should have been easy, as he worked for the city. But no employee by his name apparently worked for the city in any capacity. As day turned to night, and I spent endless hours sitting in the police station as they attempted to find any person in the world who knew me, 
I couldn't do anything but cry, and cry, and cry endlessly. A woman in a suit, who I think was either a detective or someone who happened to work in the station, sat with me for several hours and tried to keep me calm. She gave me a stuffed dog, a Dalmatian puppy that looked a bit like one of the dogs from 101 Dalmatians, and told me his name was Sparky. She said I could keep Sparky and that when they found my parents, Sparky would go home with me and make sure I didn't get lost again. She said he was a good dog and he'd protect me if I took care of him. During this time, they attempted to find my school. I told them I went to Shawnee Elementary. It was easy to find. It was really close to where I lived. But a school by such a name, you guessed it, did not exist. My school was now apparently called Anza Elementary. At one point, I was asked if the police had ever taken my fingerprints, and they had. In kindergarten, my entire class had their fingerprints taken by the police at the school gym for basically this exact reason. Unsurprisingly, this did not help at all. They couldn't find my parents, my grandparents, my neighbors, my apartment, or even me. They couldn't even find me. I was too young to remember what my social security number was, but I severely doubted it would have mattered. They asked my birthday and any relevant information that could help them figure out who I was and where I belonged, but nothing I told them turned up any information about me. At some point during the day, I was briefly taken to the ER. As the police suspected, I may have sustained some kind of head injury. After being looked over by the doctor, they found nothing wrong with me, and I was sent back to the police station. I ended up staying with someone that night. I'm not entirely sure who it was. Someone from child services, I imagine. I couldn't stop crying long enough to really focus on what was happening after this point. I cried myself to sleep several times in the police station and cried myself to sleep again at the house I stayed in that night, despite the woman who I was staying with, not the same woman who gave me Sparky, doing everything in her power to try to calm me. I clung to Sparky so hard, I'm surprised I never popped his head off. I didn't have my picture of my mom, I didn't know what was going on, and no one could find out where I belonged. This didn't make sense to me. I was only six years old and just barely. I lived where I lived and my parents were my parents and my school was my school. They didn't just all disappear one day. In between fits of crying and waking up, I begged to go home. I begged for the lady I was staying with to try and call my dad again. I just kept begging to go home. Over the next few days, I was interrogated and questioned by different people at different times at different places at all hours of the day. Police, investigators, People from the departments I still don't know, child psychologists, everyone under the sun was asking me questions. I was back and forth between the police station and the house I was staying at, until eventually someone told me that they thought they'd located my parents and they were coming to get me. Finally, I was going home. Finally, this was over. Finally, I can get away from all these strange people asking me the same questions over and over again. When the couple showed up to the police station, my heart fell into my feet, as they were not my parents. But they had a son that had gone missing, and I fit his description pretty closely. The woman started crying when she saw me, because she immediately knew I wasn't her missing son. But I was out of tears to cry at this point. Eventually, I was collected by child services, and I was taken to a foster family, where I stayed for a few months. The police launched a campaign asking for anyone to come forward with information about me. They took my picture at the police station for the newspapers to put on the news. I never let go of Sparky, not even for a second. They didn't want me to hold him in the photo because I didn't have him when I arrived, but I needed him. And I would throw an immense tantrum when someone tried to take him away. They had me put back on the clothes I was wearing when they found me, but they'd since given me new clothes to wear. In those months I spent at the foster home, parents of missing children would come to the house to see if I was their child. I didn't realize this is what was happening until I was older and looked back on it. They didn't just pull me out and say, is this your kid? They were a bit more subtle about it. The parents would come to meet me, and upon realizing I was not their missing child, they often left in tears. Looking back at all these families that came to see me in desperation that they were going to have their child back, I feel so horrible for them. It's a feeling I can't really explain. It's like a type of guilt. 
like I wish I had been their child so they could have them back and know that they were safe. Most of these people probably never saw their children again, but I try and imagine that all of them were reunited, even though I know that isn't likely. This guilt was one of the things that kept me in therapy as an adult. But like I said, no therapist has ever bought my story or believed what I've said. The most common belief suggested to me has always been that I was abandoned as a child and lived in an abusive home, dumped on the side of the road in the middle of farmland, and I repressed all the negative memories I had of my past. I didn't stay in the foster home permanently. Eventually, while my case wasn't officially closed, I needed to start going to school and I needed identification. I was issued a birth certificate for the date that I told them was my birth year, but the day and month were listed as September 17th, which was the day I was found. I never understood why they didn't just use the day and month of my actual birth, but I imagine it was because they didn't think I actually knew what it was. My name was unchanged. I started going to school sporadically. One of the child psychologists who had seen me recommended I not be placed back into a full curriculum immediately and suspected I suffered from some form of PTSD. I was put in the special class and was only made to go to school twice a week initially. Eventually, I started going to school full-time and changed foster homes a few more times. I really can't say how much time passed before it happened, but eventually I was placed up for adoption. I was never actually told I was up for adoption, so I'm not sure how soon after I was found it was. But eventually people started coming to meet me, but these people weren't looking for a missing child, they were looking to adopt one. But I definitely did not represent myself as a good candidate. I had a story that no one believed or could verify. I insisted my parents would eventually find me, and I rarely had a day that I wasn't crying until my eyes burned. The story doesn't have a happy ending. I never saw my parents again, and I was a ward of the state until I was 18 and went nowhere from there. My teens were filled with delinquency, and I did a brief stint in something similar to Juvie in San Diego called Caparel. I never went to college, and I never really started getting my life together until I was around 24. I haven't talked publicly about this before, at least not since I was a child speaking to everyone who was trying to figure out where I came from. I still have Sparky. He's old and worn, still in one piece though, no longer white. He's now a dark shade of gray. He sits on my dresser and is there, just like he's always been, as long as I've been here. So while I haven't publicly brought up or spoken about it in any large scale fashion, I've told the story to people who wanted to listen and I've gotten one question understandably repeated over and over. So before you ask it, I'll try to answer it the best I can. What things are different in the place you come from compared to where you are now? The answer is, I'm not really sure. I've been asked about countries, states, laws, planets, languages, you name it. The fact is, I don't really know. I was only six. The continents could have been completely different and I have no idea. I wasn't particularly bright either. I mean, I was hunting for rattlesnakes. I also thought California was a country. So the one thing I can say, that the President of the United States was not Bill Clinton. I can't remember exactly what his name was, but we had to learn it in kindergarten. I believe his name was Robert something or another. I want to say Robert Wilmer, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, that's my story. I doubt anyone will read this, and it will likely be buried 10 pages deep in 15 minutes, but it's now off my chest, in the open, and I can go to sleep with hopefully a little bit of weight off. My grandparents renovated and lived in a haunted home for 30 years with interesting consequences. By user, Careless Blackberry. Slow day at work, so I thought I'd share a story about the ghost in my grandparents' house in Mississippi and how it followed my grandfather to his deathbed. A little background on my grandparents. I love them very much, but they were very problematic. My grandfather was a hotshot lawyer who was a member of the Citizens Council and had countless mistresses and affairs, but also worked furiously to disintegrating public schools and defend disenfranchised laborers pro bono. 
My grandmother was vain and hellish to her maids and staff, never paid them equally, and kept a gun in her car so she could pack heat when she ran down my grandfather's girlfriends and threatened them within an inch of their lives. So these two dysfunctional people, very much a product of their times, had three children and dominated their little town in Mississippi. They were one of the few wealthy families and wanted to cement their status by buying the oldest and largest house in town, located in the heart of the tiny historic district. The house was a huge, 100-year-old Victorian, the cliché of it all, and had stood empty for 20 years and needed a complete overhaul. New roof, new walls, new insulation, you name it. My grandparents bought the house and lived in a rental for three years while they tore out the asbestos and varnished the wood floors, updating the kitchen and landscaping. They quite literally spent millions on furniture and rugs and paintings while waiting for the house to be finished. They moved into the house in 1973, and the first night there they had to call the police twice. Once they heard loud footsteps walking up the stairs and stopping outside of their bedroom door, and the other was when the kitchen door slammed shut on the first floor, shaking the floorboards. Basically, they thought someone had snuck in, evaded the police, and was still lurking around. My grandfather stayed awake all night, convinced that someone was hiding in the house. The sounds of footsteps walking up the stairs and stopping outside their bedroom door went on every night for three months. My grandmother was the first to acknowledge the presence of a ghost. She quickly learned that it didn't like electrical appliances. It had a vendetta against her vacuum cleaner in particular. The long hallway that ran through the center of the house on the first floor was called the gallery, and my grandmother had purchased a massive oriental rug to fill the space, and it required constant cleaning. The electrical outlet was on one end of the hallway, and she would plug in the vacuum and start making her way down the gallery. She would never get more than five feet down the hall before the vacuum would die, its plug having been ripped out of the socket. She would go plug it back in, start vacuuming, and a few minutes later would have the same thing happen all over again. Vacuum would die, plug would be lying on the floor. She always swore that she had plenty of slack in the cord length and that someone did not approve of the noise of the vacuum. There was also an incident where the toaster in the kitchen went missing for a day and reappeared in the trash can. Their children, my dad and aunt and uncle all claim they saw a man in the front parlor looking out the window. To this day, my aunt can't talk about the ghost without tearing up a little from nerves. When they left for college, they mostly never stayed in the house except for holidays, and even then they elected to stay at a friend's house rather than sleep in the house overnight. One day, in the mid-1980s, the niece of the original builder and owner came to town and my grandparents invited her over to see the renovations on the house. The visit ended up lasting for hours as the niece, by then very elderly, waxed sentimental on the memories she had of the place and of her uncle. He was a doctor and used the front of the house as his office and exam rooms, but died of a heart attack in the house when he was in his 50s. Apparently he was well loved and the town turned out for his funeral, which was also held in the house. The niece told my grandparents that his wife always said that he never left and stayed there to look after them. After that visit, things seemed to calm down for the next six to seven years until I was born. My mom and dad lived in the small town for a few years after my birth, and my grandmother would babysit and keep me overnight when my parents needed a break. I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the upstairs hallway and being checked on by a tall man wearing a vest and long sleeve white shirt. He checked his watch and he would nod before walking away. I brought this up to my grandmother when I was a teenager. She absolutely lost it and went into a meltdown about how ghosts aren't real and that I was making it up to upset her, so I never told her about seeing the man walk out of the greenhouse or how I saw him in the window at the end of the upstairs hallway when I played in the yard. My dad believed me, however, because the man used to check in on him, too. He'd be in bed asleep and wake up to the sound of his door opening slowly and then shutting quickly. Once he told me the background stories of the builder, I was convinced that it was the ghost of the doctor still making rounds, checking to see if everyone was okay. I never spoke his name out loud, but in my head I referred to the ghost as Dr. W. That was his given name, and from then on I began to notice more instances of bizarre activity in the house. Pillows would be rearranged on the sofa. 
doors would be left open when they were previously shut, and the dumbwaiter would often rise and fall to different floors on its own accord. But once I left for college, I never saw Dr. W. again. My grandparents sold the house when my grandfather began to show signs of early onset dementia. They built a new house out in the country where he could take walks outside without encountering cars or busy roads. The house they built was massive, but slightly smaller than the old Victorian. They moved opening in the house that occurred 40 years ago when they moved into the Victorian. Footsteps on the stairs. Kitchen appliances being terrorized. Doors opening and shutting. The activity calmed down after a few months, but my grandmother swore that she saw shadows moving through the rooms. When my grandfather began his decline, she set up a hospice room for him in the house and hired a nurse to take care of him. He began to see people in the hallway outside the room, a whole cast of characters. That man, he said once, pointing at the door, he's from the house. What house, we'd ask. You know, he'd say, the doctor. He also saw his mother, a man wearing old-fashioned spectacles, a woman holding a loaf of bread, and his sister. But Dr. W. was the one who lingered outside of his door, watching him die. When he passed, my grandfather felt someone in the room with them, and my grandfather was very agitated. Not you, he said, over and over again. Go away. Get out. I'm not sure why Dr. W. chose to follow my grandparents. Maybe he didn't have a choice. But neither of them ever directly acknowledged the ghost in conversation with me. All of the info I have is from my father and aunt. If anyone has similar experiences, I would love to hear them. My father came to tell me hello and goodbye. Written by user revolutionary ad 6858. I was adopted at six weeks old. I've always known that I was adopted because my parents would talk about when they got me, not when I was born. Not that I actually understood what that meant when I was seven when my biological father showed up to say hello and goodbye. I had the typical American family of the 70s. Two big brothers, a mom, a dad, three cats, and a dog. The only ghost I'd ever heard of was Casper. One night, very early in the morning, I woke up from a very deep sleep. I was wide awake as soon as I opened my eyes. I wasn't scared, but thought it was odd that the only thing I could move was my eyes. I looked from the window to the door, trying to figure out what woke me up. I began to hear hard heel shoes, like dress shoes, walking up the hallway. I tried to call out to see if it was my dad getting up for work. He was a professor at a local state college at the time, and always got up around 5 a.m. I couldn't make a peep. The harder I tried to talk, the more frustrated I got. Meanwhile, the footsteps stopped right by my door. I heard a young sounding man say, Wake up. I need to talk to you. Wake up. Then it switched to, Sherry Ann, wake up. I need to talk to you. This seemed to go on for a very long time. Me trying to speak and the voice urging me to speak. Now, my name is not Sherry Ann, but I knew whoever was speaking was speaking directly to me and knew exactly who I was. I felt like more was said, but I can't remember what it was. Finally, the voice said, remember that I'll always be with you. Suddenly, I could move, sit up, speak, everything like I hadn't just been struggling to do that only seconds before. Before long, I heard my dad moving around, getting ready for work. I asked him if he'd been up or if any of my brothers had been up, but he said no. Through the years, I had a feeling of that young man beside me from time to time. It became a familiar presence, and I remember my child self actually talking to the presence. I never got any feedback, but felt I was heard. Although my first experience with sleep paralysis was pleasant, if not confusing, my second and hopefully last experience was definitely not. I woke up one night feeling like there was an elephant sitting on my chest. I couldn't breathe, and I struggled against it. Nothing. I opened my eyes and could see absolutely nothing. I couldn't move and I couldn't scream. I felt, rather than saw, a struggle above me and after what I felt like forever, the force seemed to evaporate. I shot up out of bed and looked around and saw nothing. I was able to see everything because I always left my bathroom light on which illuminated the room in a shadowy glow. 
I laid back down and felt a calm overtake me, and I actually fell back to sleep. In the morning, I was doubting myself, thinking it must have been a night terror, but I still believe this actually happened to me. I think my unseen friend fought it off for me. Now fast forward 15 years. I had always been curious about my bio people and set out to find them. It was actually a very easy process. I called the social service office that had arranged my adoption, and since my bio mother had left permission for them to give me her name, I found her in less than a week. I told them that I wanted to find my bio mom and paternal grandmother. The social worker thought that it was odd that I didn't want to find my bio dad, and I told her that I didn't think it was possible. After she contacted my bio mom and grandmother, she called me back with the information. She was acting a little strangely as she told me that my bio dad had died. I said, yes, I know. He died when I was seven. She was flabbergasted. She asked me how I knew that information, to which I told her that he had come to me to tell me hello and goodbye when I was seven. The icing on the cake, my bio mom, had named me Sherry Ann. The Bottom of the Lake by user James Veggiano. I'm going to start by saying this. I'm only a kid, but I've hardly ever made stuff up. I'm a teenager, and like all people, as you grow up, you stop believing in things. Santa, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and stuff like the Boogeyman and Monsters. But I'm someone who has an open mind. I think a lot, and maybe that's why this story is so terrifying. It was a warm summer day. My family and I went up to a place called Delta Lake. It's a lake that has lots of stuff to do. There's swimming, there's a beach, there's hiking, there's camping, but the best thing was to go fishing at the lake. My father and I got his boat into the water and then the rest of my family got in. We drove the boat to the middle of the lake. There were a few other people there too, but it was so hot that most people decided to stay in, I guess. My father and I fished while my mother and sister ate snacks, when it eventually came to an end. The sun was setting, the crickets were chirping, and the water was getting cooler. It had been such a hot day that I decided to jump in the water. When I jumped in, it was very cold, but I guess I kind of enjoyed it. My dad was packing all his stuff up, and so was my mother and sister. While they were busy, I swam a little further away from the boat. And like I said, before the sun was setting and it was getting dark, I was getting tired of swimming, so I decided it was time to head back. Then just as I was about to swim to the boat, I felt something grab my leg. It felt like a hand. It was colder than the water, and I felt some sort of sharp object digging into my leg. I looked down, and I was shocked at the sight. It was a boy who looked only a few years younger than me, except he wasn't actually human. He had a pale, white face and long, sharp nails. His clothes were ripped. And that wasn't the scariest thing. As I studied his face, I noticed that his eye sockets were empty and his nose had been badly damaged. I wanted to scream and cry, but I was too scared to do anything. As soon as I got a grip on myself, I swam back to the boat as quickly as I could. When I finally got onto the boat, I looked back into the water and saw the boy staring at me with a sinister grin across his face. Then suddenly he disappeared into the water. I wanted to tell my parents, but I knew they wouldn't believe me. We got back to the shore, got the boat on the trailer, and went home. That night, as I took my nightly shower, I couldn't stop thinking about what I saw. Later that night, as I went to bed, I thought about it more and more until finally I fell asleep. Two weeks later, me and my family went up to our friend's house. It was a family of four, a mother, a father, a three-year-old daughter, and their son who was in college. That evening, my parents talked and drank beer while my sister and their daughter played together. I normally just go on my phone and watch YouTube, but the memory still haunted my mind. I guess it must have looked strange because the son that was in college asked me if I was okay. The thought had haunted me so much that I decided it was best to tell someone. I then told him everything, the boy, his face, and how he grabbed my leg. I thought he would just laugh at me and tell me I was crazy, but he didn't. Instead, he went on to tell me a story of his own. He had gone to Delta Lake years ago. I saw the same boy in the bottom of the lake. It scared the life out of him. He went back home and researched the history of the lake. It turns out that there used to be a village where the lake is now. 
and there was a story that people in the village would tell. They would say that a demon lived amongst them. He wasn't a normal scary demon, though. The demon took the form of a young, deceased boy, who would lure children towards him, then killed them. <coughs> I felt even more unsettled at this point, and it wasn't even because of the boy. It was because I remembered something. When I went into the water, I heard something. I couldn't quite understand it, but the voice was telling me to swim to the bottom of the lake. To this day, I fear that I could have died. Today, I'm in high school, and that was a few years ago. I didn't plan to tell the story until what happened today. My best friend came to school crying. He had been gone a few weeks, but today he was back. At lunch, I asked what happened, and he was sad. He said that his little brother had died a few weeks ago. He fell into the water at the lake and drowned. But my friend was suspicious about the whole situation. This was because his little brother knew how to swim, but for some reason, he just swam to the bottom and never came back up. The next part sent chills down my spine. He said that right before his brother died, he whispered to him that someone was talking to him. My friend thought it was just his imagination, but seconds before his brother swam to the bottom of the lake, he thought he saw a face and an evil smile across it. I was trembling, but then I managed to ask him where he went for that day. My friend turned to me and said, Delta Lake. Awake. Written by Kenji. Good night, baby. I love you. Night, Mama. Love you, too. I turned off the light and shut the door to my daughter's room. She just turned three last week and has ramped up her resistance to succumbing to slumber. She's a master at stalling, and I know I'll be back in her room a dozen more times before she's asleep. Half of her sleep problems recently came from her brand new playroom. Last week, at her birthday party, her older cousins were playing a game of tag through the house while the younger ones played out in the yard and in the kiddie pool. It was all fine and fun until the game got out of hand and one of the kids ended up crashing through a wooden panel located in my daughter's room. The panel is just a covering to part of the crawl space that connects one of our two attics. The first attic is in the garage and the second is upstairs and stretches over the master bedroom which is on the first floor. Our daughter's reaction to this new discovery was a series of squeals and excited hops. We just moved into the house three weeks ago and are still getting unpacked and adjusted. We hadn't even gotten a chance to check out the crawl space ourselves before the accident. And just as most unfinished things in the house, we hadn't started on repairing the panel yet. Our old house was a lot smaller and our daughter was ecstatic to be doubling the size of her bedroom. She was still holding out hope that she'd have her own playroom as well. You can see where this is leading. Although we were strict with her about not playing in the crawl space, it hasn't stopped her from ripping the tape off and entering after we put her to bed. Luckily, the space was right over our bedroom, so we could hear the second she'd go in, and we were quick to get her out before she got hurt. I was just sitting down to finish folding laundry when I heard the usual muffled, Mama! I shared an annoying glance with my husband, who reluctantly volunteered to settle her back down. He was gone for a few minutes before rejoining me on the couch. I waited patiently for him to fill me in. He smirked and said she was thirsty. Typical stalling tactic. We both shared a knowing look and shrugged it off before turning our attention back to the TV. About 20 minutes went by before she tried again. This time, I went back in. As I entered the room, I walked straight towards her bed until I noticed the bed was empty. I scanned the room until my eyes detected a small figure standing near the closet, inches away from the duct tape panel. Baby, not tonight. Daddy and I told you that's not a place to play. You can get really hurt in there. Back to bed right now. The tiny frame of her daughters defeatedly slumped her shoulders and headed back to bed. I kissed her adorably soft and always rosy cheeks and warned her not to get back up again, and we'd see her in the morning. She nodded and rolled over, snuggling her favorite stuffed pink bear. The rest of our evening played out in front of the television until my husband and I were ready for bed. He fed the dogs while I did one last check on our daughter. She was sleeping peacefully, and I shifted my gaze to the panel. The duct tape was still in place. Good. By the time I got into bed, my husband was settled in and waiting for me. 
His jeans were lazily kicked off onto the floor along with his shirt and socks. I motioned to them and he just shrugged sheepishly. I happily collapsed onto the bed and waited. He's one of those who can't sleep without touching someone. So as usual, he scooted over to my side up against my back. We've got to fix that panel tomorrow. It really freaks me out that she keeps going in there. She could fall into the insulation. I was trying not to sound naggy. I'll do it as soon as I get home from work. He leaned over, kissed my cheek, before turning back over and falling silent. I closed my eyes and drifted off. I heard a rumbling sound above my head around 1 a.m. I heard it before, but not usually in the middle of the night. That girl was in big trouble. I rolled over, almost on top of my husband, with him being so close to me. Babe, I gently whispered, she's in the space again. He grumbled something about taking away TV for tomorrow and sleepily threw his legs over the side of the bed. I heard his heavy steps climb higher until they hit the carpet and got quieter. I heard her bedroom door open and waited a bit for him to head back down. But he was taking too long and I assumed maybe he felt bad and laid with her after the scolding he dished out. I fell back to sleep. When I woke up again it was 2.30 a.m. I felt my husband's body next to me, so I snuggled up to him and started dozing off. That's when I heard it again. The thumping of feet above our heads in the crawl space. I nudged him. Babe, did you close it back up? She's in there again. He was clearly half asleep when he mumbled, You're being paranoid. I was about to say something snappy, but was cut off by a different sound. This time, the thumping sounded more like dragging. I could definitely hear something being pulled across the floor. Now, it's only plywood up there, so anything hard, including my daughter's favorite toy, Turtle, that is attached to a string for pulling purposes, would be loud. That was my initial conclusion to the noise until I heard the scurrying. My daughter is fast, but this was animalistic at best. I was frozen, listening to all the noise, confused as ever until I heard my daughter scream from up above. It was the worst sound I'd ever heard. It sounded panicked, but more than that, it sounded like a pain scream. I jolted up and violently shook my husband. He had heard the scream too and was sitting up by the time I was throwing our bedroom door open. I was in a panic, about to sprint up the stairs when my husband shouted, No! What? I shouted back. Still half turned to fly up the stairs. Our daughter was in danger. How could he possibly think it was a good idea to leave her there? Do not go up there. I was nearing rage and about to tell him to shove it when I saw her. On my husband's side of the bed, my daughter sat up, clutching her bear and rubbing one of her sleepy eyes. My heart stuttered. I knew what I had heard. But I couldn't deny the fact that our daughter was sitting in our bed. I heard more scuffles from upstairs. The office door slammed, which sent me flying back into our room. I shut the door as my husband screamed, Lock it! The office was down the hall from our daughter's room. Whatever was up there had left her room. My husband and I locked eyes. We were thinking the same thing. Get out. And that's exactly what we did. I'll never forget that night. We escaped from one of our bedroom windows with nothing but our cell phones and the clothes we were wearing. We're lucky my husband had left the car keys in the pocket of his jeans. We made a police report, but no one or nothing concrete turned up. They made note of a wooden panel being busted, and there was a broken window in the uppermost part of the attic. The strange part about the window, though, was it was broken from the inside out. My husband later told me that when I woke him to get her out of the space, he found her fast asleep in bed, and the panel was still taped. He thought I had dreamt the noise, but brought her to bed with us because he didn't want me to worry. I'll never thank him enough for that decision. As for whatever was in our house... I hope we never find out what it was or what they wanted. We moved shortly after. Childhood Paranormal Experience Written by user NGF2017 So when I was 8 or 9 years old, I lived in a home diagonal from an elderly couple. We kids referred to her as the witch, which was not meant to be in a cruel way. She wasn't scary, but she read tarot cards and would have groups of strange people over. I come from a family of horror lovers, from probably a too young of age. 
My father introduced my brother and I to 70s and 80s horror movies, much to my mother's dismay. The Exorcist, Evil Dead, Communion, Puppet Masters, Killer Clowns, they are the movies I grew up on. If you asked me as a child what I wanted to be when I was older, I'd reply forensic pathologist for the FBI like Dana Scully. My love of the paranormal led inevitably to my love of space. You watch fire in the sky and tell me you don't believe. My father and I would sit on our porch and just look at the stars. One summer night, when we were outside, a bright blue light caught my attention from the neighbor's house diagonal from ours. I looked up, and in the second story window on the right-hand side of the house, I see my neighbor's husband, and there's an incredible bright blue light behind him. He had both arms up at 90 degree angles, so his forearms are sort of framing his head on either side. Then he began to move quickly side to side. It was almost like he was vibrating. I said to my dad, look, there's Rocky, and pointed to the window. My father looked where I was pointing, froze for maybe 10 seconds, then quickly scooped me up and brought me inside. My mom could tell my dad was upset. My dad yelled at me to go to bed so he could talk to my mom. I went upstairs and cried because I was confused by what happened. I was a daddy's girl. I didn't understand how I made him upset. The next morning, I wake up and my mom and dad came to talk to me in my room. My mom sat next to me and said, paraphrasing, About last night, we didn't tell you guys because we didn't want to upset you, but Rocky passed away two weeks ago. I was dumbfounded. My dad sat quietly, just sort of nodding his head as I protested because of the night before. I honestly can't remember if he said at the time he saw him too. I don't remember anything beyond being told the man I'd seen was dead. I think it was just shock I blocked the rest of the conversation out. Fast forward 20 years, and we're at a big family dinner celebrating my engagement. The condo steers inevitably to paranormal topics as my family tells my fiancé about my creepy obsession as a kid. At one point, my father said, Ghost are real, and I asked him what about Rocky. Both my parents' mouths broke. My mom saying she couldn't believe I remembered. Well, I just stared at my dad. I asked him again, and he admitted that he saw him too. Cabin 7 by user discombobulated rub 59 One year, my mother took us kids to a state park for summer vacation. She wasn't into going camping, so she rented a family cabin in a park. The cabin was picturesque, with native stone walls topped with brown plank trim, and it featured a small bedroom, a kitchen, bathroom, and had two couches in the living room. One of the couches was a hide-a-bed. That was not. A wall plaque informed us that the park cabins had been built by the WPA in the 1930s. We had arrived in late afternoon and began unloading the car for our three-day stay. I was to hang our clothes in the tiny closet, and as soon as I opened the closet door, I got a bad case of creepy chills. Although the west-facing cabin door was open, and sunshine was streaming into the room, not one ray of light penetrated into the closet. It was like the light just stopped when it struck the open closet door. The wood trim along the opening gleamed in the mellow light, but the interior was still pitch black. I couldn't find the rod to hang the clothes on. I did not want to enter the closet to feel for the rod, and there didn't seem to be a closet light. Mom brought the flashlight. Hmm. The batteries must be low, but we could dimly see the clothes rack. My sister, 13, and me, 11, would sleep on the pull-out couch. My little brother, at 18 months, would get the other couch. Mom would sleep in the little bedroom. Unpacking finished, we hurried outside to enjoy the mountain scenery while it was still light. That night, Mom left the bathroom light on with the door nearly closed. This made a nice, dim nightlight in a strange place, except for the closet next to the bathroom. We had all been asleep for a while when I woke up without knowing why. Something wasn't right. I hadn't been aware of hearing anything, but something wasn't right. I studied the room carefully. Nothing. I panned across the room again, and that's when I saw a very tall man leaning forward over my little brother on the opposite couch. 
The man was wearing a tan trench coat like in the old Humphrey Bogart movies and a 1940s era brown hat. His back was to me and he appeared to be studying the sleeping child. I couldn't move. I couldn't even breathe. My little brother's eyes opened. He looked up at the man and began screaming bloody murder. The man then just faded out. He didn't leave, but he was gone. Now my mom was up, all the lights are on, brother's still screaming and won't settle down. My sister sits up, rubbing her eyes groggily. What's going on? Meanwhile, I'm yelling hysterically, there was a man, there was a man in here. Mom checks the exit door next to my brother's couch. It's locked. She grabs the skillet from the kitchen and checks the bathroom and the closet. She goes back for the flashlight because it's dark in the closet, but nothing. My sister gets up and grabs our little brother. He begins to calm down, but he's clutching her neck so hard it hurts. A thorough rehashing of events didn't lead to any conclusions. My sister insisted that I had a nightmare. I countered, what about our brother? Did he have one too? Mom didn't have much to say, just mostly looked thoughtful. She had never allowed us to watch ghosts or monster movies for fear that it would give us nightmares. Finally, she said we should all go back to bed and talk about it in the morning. She tried to put my brother back down on the couch, but he kicked and cried so much she wound up taking him to bed with her. She left the kitchen light on this time, and we finally got back to sleep. The next morning at breakfast, Mom explained a little about ghosts and how this might be one. She said ghosts were lost or confused souls. They couldn't actually hurt us. After <coughs> our day's activities, we would pray for the ghost and it should go away. It didn't. After our prayer session, Mom left the bathroom light on with the door open just in case. I wanted to go home. Our brother still couldn't stand the sight of the couch. My sister resented the fuss because her sunburn was bothering her. Our brother was to sleep with us on the pullout. I thought I'd never get to sleep, but finally I did. Again, suddenly, I'm wide awake. I look around and don't see anything at first. And then there he is, emerging from the closet door and walking slowly across the kitchen. Again, I can only see him from behind. In spite of the nightlight, the closet area is still shadowed. He disappeared into the little bedroom where my mom was sleeping. I wanted to call out a warning, but I was frozen with fear. A minute passes, then another. A crashing sound from the bedroom and my mother's voice loud and commanding. Out! Get out! Lights on! Rerun of last night. Mom said she woke up to see a man standing at the foot of her bed. As her eyes traveled up from the belt of his trench coat, the figure seemed to solidify. Details became sharper. She looked at his face. There wasn't one. An automotive coil shock absorber emerged from the neck of the trench coat and disappeared into the fedora hat. It raised its arms like a Bella Lugosi monster or a priest giving a benediction and began falling forward onto the bed. Right before it hit the bed, it disappeared. The crashing sound came from my mom knocking her water glass and the bedside lamp onto the floor when she went for the light. Mom agreed that she would cut the vacation short and leave as soon as it was daylight. Even though she doubted that the park would refund us the unused day of the cabin rental. Trust her to worry about something like that. My sister had to fetch her clothes from the closet as I flatly refused to go near it. She had to use the flashlight. Many years later, I relocated to a town not far from the park. Lots of locals frequent the park, but of course don't rent cabins there. I haven't found anyone yet who has heard of the ghost in Cabin 7. you all enjoyed all of our haunted tales this evening. If you would like to discuss any of the stories on tonight's podcast or just chat live with me, join our Discord server. I'm always live on there during and after the podcast every Sunday night starting at 7 p.m. Join our community on our Facebook group page and YouTube channel. If you have a haunting story of your own or artwork and you want to submit it for consideration for the future show, drop me a line on our Reddit page or email address. All our links are below in the description. Special thanks to Darken Mood, Darken underscore M00D, for all his wonderful art that you can check out on his Reddit page. I want to thank all our brave storytellers, for without them, there would be no show. A detailed list of story credits are in the description. But most importantly, 
I want to thank you, the listener, for taking time out of your day to listen to Haunted Tales from the Old Rocking Chair. I hope you have a wonderful night, and as always, sweet dreams. I don't think it'll play anything else. Um, <clears throat> well, that was tonight's podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, what did you guys think about the stories that I uh, was able to find for this one? I thought there were some really good ones. Um, if you hung out this long, I'm sure uh, you're wanting to hear this EVP. So I'm going to try to pull it up and see if uh, my technology will cooperate with me. So just bear with me one second. Pull it up here. On my computer. Let's see if I can find my... Oh, stop. Bear with me. I appreciate your patience here. All right. So, uh, let me pull it into my file here. And like I said, when this happened, I was by myself sitting on my bed in the bedroom. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was alone. My boyfriend was out watching... uh, No, he was working on something on his computer, so he had a headset on uh, when it happened. So, it wasn't him. Um, I'm talking as it's happening, so it can't be me exhaling at the same time. Hopefully you can hear it through the computer. I'm going to bump you over. Just bear with me here. Here's the waveform. I'm going to try to get you close to the speaker because I don't... I thought I brought my jack for my speaker, but I'm not sure. So we'll see if we can still hear it through the speaker. Turn the volume off. My laptop is not the best, so. I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the upstairs hallway and being checked on by a t- I don't know if you guys heard it. I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the upstairs hallway and being checked on by a t- I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the upstairs hallway and being checked on by a t- I have a distinct memory of I've got echo. There. Go off there. Let me try again. I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the upstairs hallway and being checked on by a t- I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the upstairs hallway and being checked on by a t- It happens right around here. I'm trying to get you close to the speaker. I have a distinct memory of sleeping in my crib in the upstairs hallway. I don't know. Being checked on by a t- Do you guys hear it? I mean, I could try to set up the speaker so you can hear it louder. But, yeah. I thought it was kind of weird. I thought it was fun to share. Um, get your all's take on it. Anyway. Um, so, hope everyone enjoyed the podcast tonight. 
And like I said, if you have any comments or questions, direct them um, over to the email address. Or you can message me here. I do pop back in on occasion. Um, I just, and I also want to say, you know, this is a production made possible by the Riff Radio Network. Um, if you have any questions about podcasting, anything like that, hit them up. Um, if that's it, I want to wish you guys a wonderful night. And like I said, send me messages. Let me know what you thought of the EVP because it was just kind of weird. Because I've never had anything happen since I've moved here. Um, so, that was a new one on me. Alright? So, as always, thank you for listening and sweet dreams.